Before we begin this week's Bugle, and it is a show I think you will enjoy a great deal, here is a reminder to book your tickets for the Bugle Live Review of the Year on the 30th of December, starting at 8pm UK time. That is official curtain up time. Doors will be a little bit before that, if you can indeed have doors for an online show. It will feature me, Alice, Nish and NATO as we bid an enthusiastic sod off and don't come back to the last 12 rubbish months. Tickets are available via thebuglepodcast.com and will entitle you to watch the show live and or stream it for a fortnight afterwards. Uh, After that, we might throw some of it open to the rest of the world. But if you want to see all of it while it's still relevant, buy your tickets now or after you've listened to this week's show, uh, ideally. Here it is. Strap in. I think you'll like it. (coughs) Hello, Buglers, and welcome to this, the last full Bugle of 2020, a year that has been an absolute object lesson in how to be a thoroughly shit 12 months. Now, I know I'm prejudging the last two weeks still to come, but look, who remembers Oscar's goal for Brazil in the 2014 World Cup semi-final against Germany? Not even Oscar, I imagine, remembers that goal. I imagine he wakes up every night at 4am screaming, 7 fucking one But, Buglas, if there was one thing that could sweeten the barrel of shite that has been 2020, it would surely be our guest this week. So please welcome back for the first time since before COVID. The first time since before the UK officially left the EU at the start of this year. Since even before England won the Cricket World Cup last year. Since before America voted for Donald Trump. Since before Britain voted for Brexit. Since before America even probably thought of voting for Trump and Britain genuinely gave a shit about leaving the EU. It is for the 295th time on the Bugle. The one, the only... Oh, hang on, I've lost my bit of paper. Where is it? Hang on. Uh, The one and only... John Oliver! Hello, Andy! Hello, Buglers! Guess who's back? Back again. John is back with his friend. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? I am back. I am back. Stop guessing. Because I'm back. I am back. Hello, Andy. Uh, Hello, everyone. It's great to be back to add insult to significant injury for 2020. (laughs) <laughs> and greetings to you from New York, the city that normally never sleeps, Andy, but to be honest, which has currently been put into something of a medically advised coma due to be absolutely riddled with the Rona at the start of the year and trying desperately not to re-riddle itself right now. And interestingly, Andy, it is not just the pandemic that is currently crushing New York. As I speak, it is currently snowing its frozen balls off here. Yeah. <laughs> Looking out of the window right now, it is like a picture postcard, Andy, as long as that postcard was from New York during the pandemic of 1918. Because, sure, on the surface it looks romantic, but then you realise there's still something horrendous happening underneath that really needs to be stopped. It's sort of like a a royal wedding in that way. Superficially spectacular, but once the spectacle wears off, things are going to start getting sad fast. There are are actually snow ploughs, you might be able to hear them in the distance, uh, currently trundling outside and all over the northeast. And I actually read this morning, Andy, that in Syracuse, New York, they recently held a contest to name... 10 new snowplows that they had bought and they announced last week some winners such as Blizzard Beater and Salt City Express and as names go Andy those are fine right that's a pair of serviceable names absolutely Uh, no real complaints or at least they seemed fine until I started looking at what Scotland has been doing with its snowplow names because it puts those efforts to shame Andy here are just a few of the official names on snowplows in Scotland Grit Expectations Gritalica, Gritney Spears, Penelope Gritstop, Sir Grits a Lot, Gritty Gritty Bang Bang. Those are just the grit based names. That's just one subsection of excellence. There's also, these are real, Hans Snow Low, I Want to Break Freeze, Ready Spready Go, and Snow Begone Kenobi. Those are world class <laughs> names, Andy. And look, I'll say this <laughs> at least Scotland actually tends to get some snow. England usually gets slightly less. And yet, apparently, England has not been phoning in the snowplow names either. Wiltshire. <laughs> I swear this is true, has a, has a plough called Usain Salt. <laughs> Usain Salt, Andy! When you have a name that good, it's a crime to leave that plough in storage for most of the year. They should be proudly gritting the streets in the middle of August just to keep people's spirits up. Surely no one's going to object to that. Who just shot that salt all over my flip-flops? Hold on, a vehicle called, U- called Usain Salt? Please allow me to retract my protest. Currently, no complaints on my end. And it doesn't stop there, Andy. It still doesn't stop there. Doncaster has ploughs called Gritsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Anti Slip Machinery. <laughs> and David Plowy. Those names were so good, so good, 
that they apparently rejected because they didn't have space. They rejected the name Spready Mercury, meaning, <laughs> frustratingly, that name was technically available. So excuse me if I'm now f***ing furious at what Syracuse, New York just did here. Because what they've done is they've settled for Blizzard Beater when they could have had Spready Mercury. It's a f***ing <laughs> disgrace, Andy. And a fundamental betrayal of everything that makes us human. I don't think that's overstating it in the slightest. In fact, right. I'll go one step further here. It's fundamentally yep. un-American. America, Andy, <laughs> as a nation. It's supposed to do things in the extreme. That's been its MO throughout its history. Not always for the common good. It landed on the moon. It's launched numerous wars and invasions that were completely unwarranted. It made the McRib. It is the gold standard in the extreme ill-advised action. I don't know if if anyone has seen the documentary Action Park. But if you haven't, you should. It's excellent. It's about an insanely dangerous water park in New Jersey in the 1980s run by a maniac with no regard for human life. (laughs) The the best kind of amusement The best kind. (laughs) Among the attractions that would be justifiably and thankfully illegal today, it featured an actual water slide loop-de-loop. And just picture that in your mind right now. Yeah, you're exactly right. right. That's what it was. Right. Yeah, and it, right. it turned out, it turned out, <laughs> you don't need to be, you know, an expert in physics to think that is a bad idea. <laughs> it turned out it was exactly as dangerous as it sounds. When merely right. trialling it, Andy, before the park was officially open, people were knocked unconscious and came out with scratches all over them. When, yeah. Now, when they couldn't work out exactly where the scratches came from, they looked inside and realised that the teeth of some of the people that went down it first were embedded in the tunnel and were cutting through people's skin. And yet, they opened it to the public anyway. Why, Andy? Because that's what this country does. <laughs> well, it's just like the moon landings, wasn't it? You've got to go through these difficult, you know, tricky phases. Exactly. One person in the documentary, when attempting to justify the existence of the park and the fact that while open, it hadn't just hurt park attendees, it had killed multiple people, <laughs> said, and I quote... Who wants to sit on a Ferris wheel? And look, <laughs> at its core, I just think that's, message, what, this, a that's, message for life that's what America's about, isn't it? For good, yeah. bad, and often both simultaneously. And <laughs> what this means is, I really think there should be an arms race for naming snowplows now. And it should be one that America enters and then somehow finds a way to dominate in a way that manages to destabilise the world. <laughs> the bar has been raised so, by Scotland and various English towns. Right. I mean, I, I, I take all that on board, John. And f- yeah. from the, the way you've dealt with that story, uh, yeah. all I can surmise is that, well, it's been pretty much five years since you did the bugle. You miss puns. No. You miss the puns. <laughs> no. You miss the puns. That you just is, laid it out there. It's all coming is, out now, John. There's a distinction there with a significant difference, Andy, because I, I, I was expecting you to jump on that and say that I've, I've technically just enjoyed a pun. Previously... You're quite right. I've gone on the record of being against them when deployed by you. But I, I do think there's a key difference here. I'm fine with puns. This let, let the record be clear. I'm fine with puns when the messaging device is a piece of heavy machinery. And no offence, Andy. <laughs> you're just not that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't argue with that, really. But um, well, it's great to have you back, John. It's uh, great to be back. very much the Christopher Columbus of comedy uh, in that... Uh, <laughs> You went to America and things started going very badly indeed for the people who already lived there when you arrived. Um, Fair so, hit. Fair <laughs> hit. <laughs> and uh, obviously, yeah, you, you've, you've had a busy few years since since, since you were you, you yeah. were last on the Bugle. It's a gr- great honour for you today, becoming only the second Bugle co-host after Andy Zaltzman to appear on the Bugle in three separate decades. Wow. That's got to be uh, right up there with your greatest achievements in showbiz, you'd think. Well, yeah, you would think, Andy, uh, if it were yeah. not for the fact that over the last five years as well, and if you were, but I dipped my toe back into the unforgiving volcano of movies because um, <laughs> in the last five years, Andy, I was Zazu in the Lion King remake. I'm Zazu, Andy, and you yeah. should respect me as such. I've right. got two children now, yes, but I'm also yes. Zazu, and I think that's more important. And me saying I'm Zazu, Andy, that's not my words. That's the words of the people at Disney tasked with writing on the credits who Zazu is, because it's f***ing me. And if anyone's thinking, hold on, isn't Rowan Atkinson Zazu? The answer is, in the hearts, minds and memories of every rational person on Earth, yes. But most recently, no. Chronologically, <laughs> I'm fucking Zazu. And if you don't respect the passage of time, what do you respect? Well, well I'm a movie star. I mean, I've always been a movie star. Well, of, co- of course, yeah. I mean, that was true since since I. I, I the big screen is where my heart lies. Yeah. yeah, your heart and your dignity and credibility. <laughs> <laughs> your blue smurfy heart. As a, as a film star, I'm, a, I'm basically a suicide bomber. I can take down <laughs> the film and the careers of the people in that film around me. <laughs> 
Well, so who's who's next? I mean, Bond. Bond is surely right for a, an Oliver takedown. It's a natural step. I think uh, I think the best time to be Bond is not next. It's to let Idris Elba be Bond for one film, have people like yeah. it, yeah. then step in. That's when you can irritate <laughs> people the most. We all agreed we liked him. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But you're not going to get him anymore. You're getting me. I'm right. more of a, right. a, a paperwork Bond. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I'm basically bond. Bond. 21st century Bond. <laughs> that's, what 20, yeah. that's a pandemic It's all bond. online now, isn't it? I do, I do basically everything over Zoom. Yep. <laughs> uh, gents, I've already done the most bugly possible thing that you could do to the Bond, which was oh. I, uh, as a career high, got the opportunity to make the um, official Bond podcast. Did yeah. you? Which then got pulled uh, after it had been out for one day because they cancelled the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Bugle. <laughs> Fantastic. They, do they cancel it or is it being delayed? I, I mean, I'm assuming we'll go to the cinemas again one day. Because that would be a really bold move to go, you know what, if, I, if we can't have it now, okay. we'll never have it. I'm going to put it in so a time when, capsule. Yeah, when did the y- y- your Zazu role, was it, that was what, that came out, what, 20, 2019? Yeah, I mean, when you, when you do a role that's timeless, Andy, it feels somehow <laughs> crass to put a okay. year on it. So, because there's been a lot of talk, John, about about how COVID is a huge, great conspiracy. And it, it does seem a little suspicious that it started so soon after your last, mm. your, the, the latest of your, your um, I don't know, flock of uh, move. I mean, what, what, what's is that it, the what's collective noun? A flock? A flock for, of... for turkeys. I'm not sure. But um, it's, uh, <laughs> I forget. Uh, but but that suddenly this, this, this virus that has essentially killed cinema. Yes. C- came out. Yeah. I mean, was it a conspiracy to, to, to stop you making films? Is that what we've stumbled upon? I mean, correlation isn't causation, Andy, and you'd want to peer review that thesis, but yep. um, I can't think of a good pushback to it right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's, that's a bit of a nice long intro, this. It just doesn't show nothing's changed, Andy. <laughs> nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. changed. Start nothing's talking. Changed. Yeah. Fundamentally can't focus. To yeah. a briefly entertaining and eventually frustrating degree, and the rest of the show suffers for it. We're picking up right. exactly where we left off. That's right. It's like getting on a very rusty bicycle <laughs> that has been rightly consigned to uh, to a police evidence cellar. Yeah, hope um, anyone listening to this has got a good tetanus shot. <laughs> Seventeenth of December, the uh, on this day in the year four nine seven BC, John, the first Saturnalia was celebrated in ancient Rome. The festival oh. that would eventually mutate and be rebranded as uh, as Christmas. Uh, coincidentally, four nine seven BC, the last year when anyone could legitimately say best Christmas stroke Saturnalia ever and be indisputably correct. Uh, since when those arguments have run on and on. As always, a section of the bugle is going where, John? In the <laughs> garbage. <laughs> oh God! You've changed. <laughs> burn, burn that passport. Uh, it's going in the bin this week. Uh, cryptocurrencies as uh, Bitcoin hits an all-time high of twenty thousand dollars per bit of made-up coin. Uh, we look at the cryptocurrencies that could shake shake up the uh, cryptocurrency market in twenty twenty-one. People are getting a bit bored of cryptocurrencies, and uh, it does seem the markets are going to double down on the cryptoitude of the boring old traditional cryptocurrencies with crypto cryptocurrency. So Bitcoin uh, could be shoved to one side. We're looking at uh, new things on the scene like MetaWedge, Sudo and Boulder Cash. And uh, crypto cryptocurrencies, uh, I mean, set to take the economic world by storm next year. Uh, Magic Beans could be one. Happiness, uh, love. Uh, I think that could be the great cryptocurrency of next year because it's turned out money can buy made up other forms of money. So the Beatles could have been wrong about money not being able to buy you love after all. And, uh, of course, the Australian dollar. Uh, so um, do follow that over the next 12 months. Uh, also in the bin, uh, Christmas has been cancelled. Uh, we uh, it's An obituary for, for this year's Christmas. Uh, I mean, I, Christmas has been the, the latest victim of cancel culture, John. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, this... Um, it's not just governments cancelling Christmas in a selfish effort not to have to explain massive death rates for the whole of next year, but uh, cancel culture has cancelled Santa Claus due to uh, animal cruelty allegations, the exploitation of workers and a lack of uh, equal opportunity provision uh, in his workforce. And, uh, you know, the Christmas story from the Bible, ripe for cancellation, I would say, John. Oh, yeah? Um, you know, expresses extremely prejudicial views about Jewish run-ins, offering unlicensed midwifery services and unhygienic birthing suites. 
three wise men, not exactly diverse, and uh, with their non-sustainable frankincense as well, and non-fair trade gold and myrrh could easily trigger people who've ever been really cold and can't hear the syllable myrrh without suffering serious flashbacks. Uh, those sections in the bin. The fact, Andy, that you've not released a cryptocurrency and called it a bugle buck shows that you've just <laughs> never really been in this for the money in the extent that, you know, you really should have been. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that is so t- I mean, it did take us pretty much four and a half years to get a new lot of merch uh, yeah. <laughs> after the old lot of merch turned out to have, uh, you know, a quitter uh, built into the logo. <laughs> <so. clears throat> Top story this week. What the f*** has happened since you were last on the bugle? Um, John, I mean, it's yeah. been a while. It's been a while. A lot of stuff has happened. Uh, on one of the very last bugle shows you did, um, we talked about the Republican candidates for the 2016 election, yeah. which was still some time ago. Ridiculous candidates that have really disappointed uh, all fans of American democracy would have degraded the political legacy of the USA, the likes of Rick Santorum, Marco Rubio, Ben Carson, we talked about George Pataki, a joke candidate, obviously, who at the time was way out in the betting at 50 to 1 alongside Donald Trump. And yet, is that true? Are, that, 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 he, he was polling at Pataki levels? <laughs> he, he, well, in the betting, certainly. So here we are. I mean, y- y- you left the bugle, John. Yes. Uh, Trump got elected, uh, Brexit happened, and there's been a worldwide pandemic. I mean, it's, uh, mm. I mean, you say, you know, Correlation is not causality, but that is a, that's a f- of a lot of pretty uh, pretty negative evidence for you there. Man. Yeah, well, it's been, you know, you can't deny it's been a spicy half of a decade, Andy. <laughs> this five years was a lot of things, but it wasn't dull. Uh, you know, no, it was reckless. True. Yes. Yep. It was inhumane. Yes. It was an amplification of some of the humanity's darkest instincts. It was the sadistic natural endpoint to late stage capitalism, but it was not boring, Andy. <laughs> It, there was some real edge of the seat stuff. It's all Brexit, the election of Bolsonaro and Trump, a pandemic, and the boom and bust of the fidget spinner. Now, <laughs> the fact is, a lot fit, politics yeah. and culture has changed forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't have been with you, Andy, over the last four, four years to fiddle while Rome burned. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but at least I can get my violin out of my case now and screech out a song. <laughs> Yeah, you've, you've been throwing petrol on the violin, John. Um, I'm not sure that even makes sense, but I'm sticking with it. Uh, so, so here we are. We're coming up now, uh, end of December 2020. Trump is coming up to the final month of his first term. Yes. Um, and Because let's not rule out that second term, John, whether it starts uh, on January the 20th this year or in uh, you know the day after that uh, th- through the medium of, of divine intervention. Uh, because, I mean, he was, he's was he been unfairly robbed, do you not think, of a second election win merely by the fact that he didn't win. Do you not think that's that's the kind of injustice that we democracy should be trying to move beyond? Well, you know, if you, if you don't think of justice as binary, Andy, if you, if you think yeah. of, you know, there are lots of shades of grey there, then you know, there's lots of shades of grey to work with. Also, just to pick yeah. you up, I really wouldn't rule out a third, a <laughs> third <laughs> Donald Trump term already. Now, right. words don't mean what they used to. I don't really <laughs> see why numbers should either. There's a, there's a lot more wiggle room semantically yeah. than, than you might, than you yeah. might think now. But but the thing, I mean, since you were on the bugle last, John, America has basically become a much derided, even kind of sympathised with rogue state, and New Zealand has essentially become a global superpower. So I mean, how, how can how, how can you explain how can you explain that? New Zealand is a global superpower. Yeah. And the idea, right? I know their their current leader, uh, you know, has has some leadership skills. The idea that John Key ever led yeah. a superpower. <laughs> It, that the canary in the coal mine there is coughing and already building itself a little coffin. <laughs> I, I, will, I will say though, that this week saw yeah. some small but significant news, uh, yeah. Andy, because the official electoral college vote was held here in the United yes. States to determine the next uh, president. Thrilling stuff. Brilliant. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing usually it is a routine procedural yeah. step that takes place in which no one notices due to the fact it's a routine procedural step and who really gives a <laughs> shit about those. But, you know, that's very much not been the case this year due to the fact that the current the president United, of the United States is still refusing to accept the results of this election. Um, 
<laughs> not just that, he's also continuing to act like a one-man wrecking ball to the very foundations of American democracy, swinging back and forth and smashing into institutions that you desperately hope are going to hold up, but do seem to be exhibiting some worrying cracks. Now, I'm not <laughs> sure if everyone uh, understands America's electoral college system in the UK, and to be honest, I'm not even sure anyone really understands it here in America either. And the reason for that <laughs> is really twofold. Uh, it's both yep. complicated... Uh, and it's also completely nonsensical. So I couldn't <laughs> take the time now to fully explain it to you. But to be honest, you would just really be left with the same question you have right now, which is probably, well, why the f*** do they do it like that? <laughs> to which there isn't really a good answer other right. than, well, this is just the way it's been done for a long time, which historically is a response that has been used to justify some pretty appalling behaviour. <laughs> Well, also, I mean, I'm sitting here in London. I'm sitting a few short miles from Westminster, the Houses of Parliament, and Boris f***ing Johnson sitting in Downing Street, riffing out his somewhat overwritten parody prime ministership. <laughs> it's not really for me as a Brit right. to criticise a right. ridiculous electoral system 100 years past its best before date. Or more, not so much its best before date, it's still vaguely just about sensible until date. As you say, it's one of those things that if you invented it now, the electoral college system, people would quietly take you to one side and say... How about you shut the f*** up until you've got something sensible and grown up to say, you total f***ing idiot? Yeah. That's, that is the beauty with having a system gradually metastasise over time. You don't realise how stupid it is until you're inside it and you think it should have been this way all along. But the fact is... <laughs> it's very much what happened with the bugle, to be honest. <laughs> the fact is this vote happened and the election is now close to being more over than it was last month when it was, to be honest, already over. And the, the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, who is, I think it's fair to say, Andy... Not, not a perfect man. <laughs> Finally, publicly acknowledged that Trump was not going to get a second term uh, this week, saying on the Senate floor that today I want to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden. While, while McConnell seems to have received credit in some quarters for his speech, it really should be taken with an absolute avalanche of salt, because how grateful <laughs> should you be for something that is 40 days late for no good reason? If you went out to dinner, Andy... The waiter took your order, then over a month later, turned up at your house with a plate of cold carbonara. Should you be required to say thank you? Or are you allowed to scream, where the f*** was this 960 hours ago? What have you been doing all this time? Because make no mistake, Andy, Mitch McConnell's speech is the cold carbonara of congratulations messages. <laughs> And it, well, I mean, how's he, how's he cook that carbonara? Because, I mean, if it's anything like my carbonara, I'd still take it after a month. I mean, I'd make a very fine twist and nutmeg. That's the absolute key. Absolute. And, and also, it makes it kosher, I believe. For, <laughs> that, that, wow. That, um, that understanding of kosher, Andy, really uh, does yep. em, embody the, the way that you have stuck to rigorous Jewish teachings over the years. <laughs> um, for his... <laughs> But for his part, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer urged Mr. Trump to end his term with a modicum of grace and dignity. And look, <laughs> I get why he feels he has to say that, Andy, but everyone knows that's just not going to happen, is it? Because for all his faults, Donald Trump has been completely consistent across his lifetime in showing absolutely no inclination to even trace amounts of grace and dignity. To him, Andy, grace and dignity has as much a place in a human life as you think pineapple has on a pizza. The <laughs> idea of that very combination turns his stomach and offends him to his fundamental core. And yet, despite, despite the fact that Schumer must have known that his message would be just as effective if he wrote it on a piece of paper, then swallowed that piece of paper and then thrown himself down a well... He went on with his, his entreaties, saying, for the sake of our democracy, for the sake of peaceful transition of power, he should stop the shenanigans, stop the misrepresentations, and acknowledge that Joe Biden will be our next president. And again, that just isn't going to happen, is it? You're asking him to do something he's physically incapable of doing. It's like trying to start a band with an antelope. You can ask it to play bass all you like, but it's got hooves, Andy. It's got hooves. Appealing yeah. to it to do a serviceable walking baseline actually says more about your misplaced expectation of it than it does about that antelope's future failure. <laughs> I reckon it could probably do a job on a tambourine, couldn't it? Could you put some bells on its antlers? Sure. That's not that outlandish, mate. Andy, you're, that outlandish. You're, Andy you're building a straw man here. I did, I did not right. say an antelope <laughs> would not be an excellent tambourine player. I said it, it, you're not going to put... You can strap a bass around its neck... But right. from that point on, you're asking for too much. How, how much practical research d did you do into that, John? That's, that's what I want to know. Well, I've, I, mean, I pride myself, Andy, on research now. So yeah. I'm not going to tell a joke yeah. unless I have a room just back yeah. here with 14 different antelope with bases <laughs> strapped around their neck who are in a controlled right. setting 
Right, and then yeah. another room with another fourteen where someone else is running. Because this is you know, the, if the joke has to work. It has to be fundamentally solid, <laughs> Andy. Honestly, one of them, we, one we, of we them, unhelpfully got pretty good at the bass. But I, I think that was an outlier. <laughs> I think you let that go. Are we talking? Are we talking only bass? Because are you talking like upright, a double bass? I mean, because you think that might actually high right. strong bass, Andy, like, like Peter, like Peter Hook in New Order. But this is when this is my, this is this is your this this is the problem with this. You surely with an antelope. You use the antlers, you rest your double bass in the antlers, and it uses its other hoof to... I just, I think you've got, you've, your experimentation has been... Your methodology's flawed. Shit, Andy. Excuse me for a minute. I need to go to apologise to some very angry antelope. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is... So... <laughs> the fact is, nothing in Trump's behaviour this week has suggested that he is an open receptacle for McConnell's request. He's gone on a Twitter tear again, amplifying conspiracy theories, and replied to Mitch McConnell by tweeting at 12.40am, which is really the best time for human beings to tweet. He said, <laughs> Mitch, 75 million votes, a record for a sitting president, brackets, by a lot, close brackets, too soon to give up. And the thing is, it is true, Andy. He did get 75 million votes. And that is, he's right. It is a lot. But he, he is leaving out a pretty crucial piece of context there, and that is that Biden got 7 million more votes than he did. And that fact really does throw a spanner into the washing machine of the rest of his sentence there. Because unless I'm very much mistaken, the rules of the election were not which candidate can get closest to exactly 75 million votes, but be careful, because if you go over, you're then disqualified. If I am mistaken about that, Andy, Trump has a real case here, but I am surprised that I'm only hearing about it now through my own face. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, Joe Biden has been confirmed as the Hercules for our times to clean up the four years of political and social effluence mm -hmm. in Trump's Orgean stables. I mean, there's all this talk about cleaning the swamp, John, when uh, Donald Trump uh, heroically took draining over. It, draining it, draining it, Andy. He never said he'd clean it. He wanted the swamp out of there. He, did, he, right. he wasn't just trying to purify the water and bring the right. natural bacteria back. Because it seems to me that he's, he's drained the swamp very much in the same way that a doctor would g give you an enema by shoving a large rocket up your fundament and blasting you into a quarry full of shit. That that seems to be the way that he's... Is it, I mean, is that an accurate representation? Well, you mean that you can technically call what you're doing an enema, but the result just doesn't doesn't <laughs> fundamentally back that claim up. Yeah, I mean, if anything, it's made, it's made things worse, hasn't it? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you, you keep uh, saying you've given me an enema. Why am I in a quarry? No, that's, <laughs> well, I'm quarry you have shit. to be able to answer a question like that. Yep. Now, the next big procedural step here comes on January the 6th. That is when Congress is supposed to officially tally the results and certify Biden's victory. And there have been calls right. from Trump and his allies for that certification to be held up. Calls that McConnell is now trying to manage by reportedly holding a conference call with his fellow Senate Republicans, urging them to not participate in any efforts to object to Biden being certified as the winner of the election. He was backed up by Senator John Thune, who apparently said it would be great if there were no members that took up that issue. And I agree with Senator Thune there, Andy. It would be great. I mean, what would be even greater would be if Republican leadership had not allowed their party to get to the point where any of this even needs to be said out loud. But it does seem that we've all been a, a little disappointed on that count. And I have to say, it really is not easy to hear them complain about the behaviour of their membership when they are so emphatically complicit in creating this mess. It's like the old saying goes, Andy, if you're running a circus, don't complain if the elephants are shitting everywhere. <laughs> it's what they do. And it's your fault that they're in the f***ing tent in the first place. <laughs> Let's move on to the correct side of uh, the Atlantic and another thing that plopped out into the world in the chaotic vacuum left across the globe by your departure from the bugle. Mm -hmm. uh, Brexit. Uh, negotiations as we speak are going to the wire and that wire is barbed uh, it's electrified as well and in classic British, British faction the ruling classes are more than happy to just hurl people into that barbed wire to see what happens and then wait hopefully for America to bail us out I mean John you've been a, you've been you left this country a long 2006 and mm. you know we Boris Johnson is is prime prime minister Bo Boris Johnson John is prime minister Prime Minister, Prime Minister job. Ought to have, ought to have two people named Boris Johnson. Bo Boris Johnson is. There was a politician prime... that emerged, a viable politician called right. Boris Johnson, that emerged at the same time right. as that ridiculous, uh, yeah, ridiculous man happened. who edited the Spectator for a while. And well, it you know, it didn't. Quite, it wasn't. Uh, no, it's unfortunately not. It's not two separate people. It's it's that that same 
Yeah, it's a man who in his previous career could not be trusted with a typewriter, has now been trusted with a country and its entire future. I mean, it's... Well, I mean, it's choice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's suboptimal, I think, from a, from a British, British point of view. Um, Again, Andy, I, I mean, mean, it's a difficult... As, as, someone, as someone who now holds both British and American passports... You know, it does yeah. feel like I have a foot in in each in two countries, neither of which you know, have been uh, have been making yeah. some very smart long term yeah. political decisions of late. Yeah, you've got you've got a foot in each country, and there is shit over both of those shoes. <laughs> I mean, he's at the moment clearly with Brexit. It's a difficult job. He's trying to steer HMS Brexit. Yeah. Over the troubled, troublesome seas between the Scylla of sense and the Charybdis of consensus, making sure he doesn't tragically founder on either of those two terrifying fates and can instead sail onwards uh, into the uh, ocean of national obsolescence. Um, these are these are strange. I mean, has it? I, I don't know how you know how it's viewed in America. And you know, there's a lot of talk about you know Britain kind of t- you know t- going global again and the talk of the the trade deal that might not be quite so good under. Under Biden, I mean, what? Um, how, how do you see the next few years panning out for us? I mean, I've got absolutely no idea, Andy, because you know, I don't know if you've, uh, I don't know if you've googled America over the last twelve months, right, but uh, right. you know, it's been dealing with its own shit right now. So oh, while there might have been even some more be curiosity in the early days of Brexit, I think <laughs> they, they would check in every now and then, saying, "Oh, have they not done that yet?" And so I, d- yeah. I don't think there is really, a, you know, a popular understanding that the cliff edge that Britain yeah. is about to Thelma and Louise itself off. Is coming yeah, up yeah. if I'm if I'm right on December thirty first. That is when yeah. <laughs> the hard Brexit is. You, you're basically not, going to be jumping yeah. off a cliff and then into yeah, a yeah. solid brick wall. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. It's not just. I mean, it's a solid brick wall, but it's at the bottom of the cliff. So we've actually got quite a fun. Oh, that's like, nice. Float, float down. Well, I think we'll float. I'd, uh, we'll just yeah to to the brick wall. But yeah, brick brick walls are not. We're built on brick walls. I mean, what is the what is the mood in uh, in Britain, Andy, regarding Brexit? Is it confidence? Is it uh, well? Traditionally, uh, if Britain goes into into any any adventure with anything less than massive yeah. overconfidence, things tend not to go very well. They tend not to go that well. I th- I don't know if you can say it's confidence. I think we're the the mood is very much the mood of a room full of people. Uh, uh, well, a room full of men, really, mm. uh, all naked, with a load of electrical sockets and. Half the people in there want to put their penis in the sockets, right? And the other half of the people don't, but are being forced to put their penis penises in those sockets because they lost a vote about whether or not they had to f- the sockets four and a half years ago. So it's that kind of. I don't know if you can imagine that awkward. I mean, you didn't go to the same type of school that I went to, so you probably don't have quite such a you know, lively kind <laughs> I was of easy say, way. Of say, Andy, that, I know this. This is just rolling right off the tip of your tongue. This sock fucking <laughs> business, but I'm not sure that it's a, a metaphor that n- yeah. necessarily feels innate to many. No, but I mean, it's an interesting choice we're going to have to make, really, because I mean, if if you look at it objectively, the position Britain is going to be on the, on the first of January, you know, a, 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 alone as a country, uh, you know, we'd look around and look at countries that we could do business with. And, you know, obviously we want to be the new Singapore and that, but that's not that practical, really. Uh, you know, there's countries you know, that we could trade with more, like Australia and New Zealand, but they're miles away. And then you think, well, there's a massive great trading block 25 miles away. Oh, why, yeah. why don't we Why don't we give that a go? That's that a would seem idea. to be the logical... That's a great And that, surely that would, be, that, that would be the compromise that would please both sides, wouldn't it? I mean, I do think at this, at this point, the, the the smartest bet, which is obviously one that yeah. isn't going to get taken, is to try and George Costanzi way back into the EU and just keep turning up to meetings and pretend nothing, nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> Go full Costanza on this. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about, Brexit? Why would we do that? <laughs> You're being weird. Anyway, what were you saying about tariffs? <laughs> Uh, let's move on to uh, well the story that's defined this year uh, the, the the COVID virus now obviously uh, with the scientific uh, and economic resources at uh, America's and Britain's disposal you would have expected both of our countries uh, to uh, deal with this virus um, well I mean much less well than most of the world's mm. poorest nations uh, so it's it's gone pretty much as as you would have thought don't you think yeah I mean it's we live in countries Andy you and I uh, whose yeah. response to this pandemic has basically been throwing a dart. Uh, missing the massive bullseye, missing the board and hitting someone in the carotid artery. I guess it could have been worse, but it's yeah. obviously hard to imagine exactly how. Responses yeah. here in the US, Andy. Well, particularly as that person that it's hit is ourself. <laughs> we just we just hurled a dart. That's right. 
<laughs> it's very hard own... to do. It's very hard to do under the conditions that you're luxurious in the luxurious <laughs> position to have. It's hard to do it that badly. Uh, responses in the US, uh, Andy, have ranged from the sinister to the truly stupid. Um, here in America, the obsession with protecting the stock market has helped America's uh, basically uh, state of market worship has moved it into a fully functioning death cult. And there, there have clearly been many well-documented cases of individualism being taken to a genuinely dangerous degree here over the last nine months. And while I know that the UK is not without cases of homicidal stupidity, I do think this is another case where American exceptionalism is at play. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's play a hand of uh, right. pandemic poker here, Andy. Okay, I see right, your yeah, government yeah. ministers uh, not yeah. following their own coronavirus guidelines, and I'll raise you yeah. this. <clears throat> 41 people tested positive for coronavirus after attending a swingers convention in New Orleans. <laughs> Wait. There is, in a very real sense, Andy, more. <laughs> the convention was apparently called Naughty in New Orleans, uh, which, to be fair did turn out to be true. It was naughty. It was very naughty <laughs> behaviour. You could argue criminally so. Uh, and around 250 people attended this convention in mid-November. One of the infected swingers was reportedly hospitalised in a serious condition and the event's organiser wrote in his blog, if I could go back in time, I would not produce this event again. I wouldn't do it again <laughs> if I knew then what I know now. And while I, I do appreciate that sentiment, Andy, it's important for all of us to learn from our mistakes. It is worth noting that this event took place in f***ing November. And, you, know, <laughs> November the, you know, the exact November that was last month, a time in which I would oh, argue oh, the oh, dangers oh. of holding yeah. such an event were fully understood. Was he, <laughs> did this organiser honestly not hear about the coronavirus until just this month? Was he simply <laughs> too horny all year to turn on the news? <laughs> Was the pandemic not even mentioned at any of the bang fiestas I assume he spent the whole year attending? It must have been. How does pre-orgy small talk, Andy, not include the biggest thing happening to the planet at that time? Because it is worth noting, just to be clear, and I guess it's just safest to be clear always now, an Eyes Wide Shut style orgy mask is not, I believe, on the list of WHO approved masks to combat COVID. <laughs> And I also think I that would have been a less atmospheric true, film, Andy. That would have been a much <laughs> less atmospheric film if everyone had been wearing N95 masks <laughs> and socially distancing. What's the password? Yeah, I was good. Fidelio, yeah, can... and also wash your hands for at least two happy birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, is it? I mean, I, I, I'm a, I'm not fully up to up mm -hmm. to speed with current trends in the swinging scene. I, I will I'll lay my cards on the table there. But I, I, I mean, is it? It must be quite hard to socially distance and effectively uh, swing at the same. That seems logistically problematic. It's yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know if the 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 difficulty of the logistics are part of the thrill. Yeah. There, there's a lot right. I don't understand there. But yes. you know, may, maybe maybe at the end of the day. We are trivialising what is essentially a group of very earnest problem solvers. Yes, I guess so. And and I mean here we, we've you know there, there's a lot of debate of exactly the circumstances in which you are allowed to meet people from outside your social bubble, whether that's to see your you know your elderly parents at Christmas mm -hmm. or to f a load of strangers. Mm -hmm. And you know they're very much two sides of the same of the same coin. The, the government sort of still trying to find a way of cancelling Christmas that involves giving a lucrative contract to a close friend uh, of the prime minister, uh, and they haven't quite nailed that. Uh, yet, so the, the current situation, John, is mm -hmm. that uh, we are allowed to go and visit uh, our families at okay. Christmas, but the government is saying that we shouldn't. So they're saying we can, but but we shouldn't. And right. this is, uh, I don't know, not so much sitting on the fence as slam dunking someone else onto that fence. <laughs> um, the chief medical officer. Professor Chris Whitty said these words about meeting up at Christmas just yesterday. And I think these words sum up, in many ways, the whole of this year. He said, just because you can do something doesn't mean it's sensible in any way. Now, I think that those might be the most appropriate words, not just for 2020, actually, but for everything that has happened since, well, 2016. Indeed, in, for the third millennium, for the history of... All humanity encompassing empire and exploitation. If one <laughs> phrase can sum up the human project so far from the day that God got bored and thought, I'll oh, chuck some f***ing people in it before I knock off at the weekend. The entire, I, I think it would be that these were just because you can do something doesn't mean it is sensible in any way. Can we not have this tagged onto the Ten Commandments, John? Not I mean, just, it's obviously not a commandment. It's more a piece of friendly advice. But, but then so with things like don't cover your neighbour's ox. That's an advice. That's a bit of advice, really. That's just practical kind of neighbourhood watch type advice, isn't it? Not, not just that, Andy. I think that should be a mandatory tattoo that people have. Because <laughs> as a tattoo, it really works on every possible level. <laughs>
We can have it in all religious texts in the the Magna Carta. You can yeah, you're in America. You can use your contacts there. It's a newly unearthed Second and a Half Amendment. Just because you could do something doesn't mean it's sensible in any way. That 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 goes very well with the Second Amendment, John. Surely that that they must have that oh, must God, have been meant right. to be in there. Oh God. All right. Okay. That's well. Those yeah. are arbitrary guidelines. Those are pretty good. I'm pushing all my chips over the table here, Andy. Okay. Yeah. Um, Texas Monthly ran an eye-catching, ar- <laughs> eye-catching article this week titled "This: Texas Wedding Photographers Have Seen Some Shit," and it is <laughs> this thing is a story that fully lives up to that headline, Andy, because there are some <laughs> maddening anecdotes in there. This is how the writer Emily McCullough begins the story. <clears throat> The wedding photographer had already spent an hour or two inside with the unmasked wedding party when one of the bridesmaids approached her. The woman thanked her for still showing up, considering everything that's going on with the groom. When the photographer asked what she meant by that, the bridesmaid said the groom had tested positive for COVID-19 the day before. She was looking for me to be like, oh, that's crazy. Like I was going to agree with her that it was fine, the photographer recalled. So I was like... What are you talking about? And she was like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't freak out. He doesn't have symptoms. He's fine. And the photographer (laughs) tested positive a few days later. It is hard to know, Andy, what this period in human history is going to be called in the future. People alive during the Renaissance didn't know that they were living during the Renaissance. My best guess at the moment is we're currently living in the mid-period of mankind's wittery age. And I dread to know what late stage wittery brings us to. There was... I, I think that is wildly optimistic, John. I th- I'm not sure we've reached the mid stage yet. I think we've got a, a long way to go to get that far. I think was... we're, we're still we're exploring the full extent of human idiocy. There's so I mean, this is this is this is like those early kind of 14th century frescoes, just a little a way off from <laughs> from the Sistine Chapel. You know, this is simple. I mean, we can get way way more witted than this. You know, tangentially related to this, there was a story I read yesterday uh, in uh, for a study released in Australia that claimed that kangaroos can communicate with humans. And and the, <laughs> if the sole message that those kangaroos are currently communicating is anything other than what the f*** is wrong with you idiots? <laughs> I am calling bullshit on that study. <laughs> um, I was reading a, a New York Times article about, uh, about the, the British government's uh, efforts to deal with this, uh, uh, the COVID crisis. And um, it noted that Boris Johnson was put in the country, uh, this was back in March, uh, on a, quote, war footing. Now, the difference, uh, I guess, with World War II is I, I don't recall reading about how an entire squadron of fighter planes was provided by a cheesemonger friend of Winston Churchill at eight <laughs> times over the market rate um, before the melty cheddar jets proved no match for the Luftwaffe. I, don't, well, that's, I guess that's the difference. You know, it's kind of similar. Fog of war, Andy. Details get forgotten. It yeah. could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> There's another uh, uh, related story this uh, this week. Uh, UNICEF is providing food for children in the UK for the first time in the 70 year history of uh, the organisation. Oh, that's of UNICEF rather than, than the UK, which of course has been here since the very dawn of time. Um, <laughs> it's the first thing God invented. Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't listen to Julius Caesar. I mean, you can't. I don't know what language he's speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Some filthy foreign nonsense. Uh, so you, UNICEF are feeding hungry children in in Britain. Now we, Britain is one of the world's richest countries. Uh, but now Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, and uh, you've done very well to to leave the country before he became a real prominent politician, John. Uh, yeah. He's uh, he's dismissed this as an act of political provocation. Um, and he's right. UNICEF have no business. Like if 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 multimillionaires like Jacob Rees-Mogg, in a country with the collective wealth that Britain has, want to watch our own British children Britishly starving, that is our own British business. This is why we voted for Brexit, John, so we can keep our own children as hungry as we deem appropriate for the overall good of the nation, without the woke brigade at the UN sticking their bedwetting stop children starving oar in. And don't stick your f***ing oar in anyway. We're Team GB. We always win at rowing. Mostly uh, with teams made up of people who were properly fed as children, but that's not that's not the point. It's only by starving some children that we can get other children uh, uh, enough nutrition to grow into six foot six inch super athletes designed and bred to triumphantly rob a two kilometer rowing course as fast as an old man on a bicycle. But anyway, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm off Andy, the point here. I, I don't yeah. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with right, that particular okay. Brexit argument. But I will say it's the first one that I've heard that is intellectually consistent. It's intellectually <laughs> bankrupt, but it's consistent. <laughs> 
I mean, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg is not only the MP for West Caricature, he's also the Secretary of State for the re-establishment of the 19th century. <laughs> and what happened in the 19th century, John? Britain ruled the world, and we had loads of starving children. So butt out, Brussels. Oh. Was this Brussels? I don't know. They're all the same, these multinational institutions. Butt out. <laughs> Sexy frog news now, and, John, things have been hot for frogs in France, and I don't mean in the frying pan with some garlic like normal. I mean hot, sexy (laughs) hot, so hot that a French judge has told frogs to stop frog shagging because they're keeping an entire village awake with their vigorous interfrogling. This is uh, probably the biggest story of the year so far. I mean, it's it's an absolutely tremendous story, Andy. Is it important? No. Is it the kind of story (laughs) the world should be focusing on right now? Honestly, not really. Does it seem <laughs> worth spending time on it anyway? Of course it does. Because <laughs> this is a story about a bunch of noisy French f- frogs, Andy. And when a man is tired <laughs> yeah. of a story about that, yeah. he's truly tired of life. Apparently, Indeed. after nine years, <laughs> nine years of legal battles, Michelle and Annie <laughs> Pecharras have been instructed that they have exactly 90 days to drain their 300 square metre pond and get rid of their <laughs> f- frogs. And I tell you what I admire here, Andy. Drain the swamp. <laughs> <laughs> Actually drain the swamp. What I admire about this is that this lawsuit continued through this year. Because there must have been a temptation once the world was gripped by a global pandemic to think, you know what? You you know what? (laughs) Let's forget it. Let's just forget it. Because, you know, at the end of the day, they're they're just (laughs) frogs. Let's just just live and let live. There there are more important (laughs) issues to be getting worked up about right now. And I'm sure that, you know, for a moment, probably early in the spring, you know, that, that, that must have been tempting. But then I'm guessing that uh, a few months later, maybe on a midsummer day, when the neighbours woke up early in the morning, enjoyed a high quality pastry, with their high quality <laughs> coffee, and then opened their windows to let the sweet Dordoin air in. <laughs> only to be greeted by the sound of grunting f- frogs <laughs> attempting to clumsily impregnate each other in the middle of a filthy pond. They must have thought, you know what? F it. F these frogs don't tell me that they couldn't do this quieter this feels like a choice we're going back to court <laughs> well in britain we have such backlogs in our legal system that actual major crimes are not being prosecuted for the two three three years but f- france france will if it involves a frogs and b things having sex with each other they will find a way john up the priority list a petition to save these frogs has now reached more than ninety-seven thousand signatures <laughs> In the last three days. That is 96,500 more people than live in that village. And there's a reason for that, Andy. Because France is fundamentally forgetting what it is at its core here. It's a nation unafraid to celebrate the pleasures of the flesh, frog flesh included. If these (laughs) frogs, Andy, cannot rut each other at precisely 63 decibels, because that apparently... 63. That apparently... It's around the the, the volume of a washing machine, apparently. That's what what it was timed as. But, uh, John, I, I... I mean, you're much more of an expert on uh, extremely loud uh, amphibiological sex than, than me. <laughs> Thank it, you. It's the 63 decibels. It, was that from all the frogs, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or was it from one particularly horny pair of frogs going absolutely <laughs> frog sex I crazy? I really love the idea that all the frogs are quiet apart from one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're always going, you're gonna, you're, we're going to lose our swamp. And I, I love, I love. You're a great frog. You're a great frog. But there's, you're going to get us kicked out of the swamp. But the thing I is, mean, Andy, if they can't do that, if they, if the frogs cannot pound each other at 63 decibels in France, where in the world can they do it? <laughs> don't worry. The answer is Belgium. They can do it there. It's about an eight-hour drive from Dordogne. I don't know what that is in hops, but I'm sure frogs have a pretty good internal conversion chart. Go to Belgium, frogs, or, or New Orleans. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, these copulating Kermits, uh, incidentally, um, was um, was um, originally an X-rated burlesque tribute act to the uh, CIA operative Kermit Roosevelt's uh, role in the uh, overthrow of the Iranian uh, Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. Well, that's back in a the really 50s. interesting detail, yeah. Andy. I'm glad you was, glad you managed uh... to truffle that out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's nearly time for this uh, this uh, special edition of the Bugle yeah. to, uh, to to come to an end. Um, and um, well, I hope you'll be able to come back on uh, at some point next year, John, with a new a new. Pre- will you miss Will you miss Will you miss Trump? Do you think? Not on any level, no. Right. Not on any sensory level whatsoever. Yeah. yeah.
So, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll miss him and, uh, you know, all oh, the you members will. of his uh, administration, if that's uh, the right word, the cabinet members, the personal lackeys and the uh, the Lickspittles. In fact, I was invited to a special um, a Christmas leaving do at the White House oh, by no. the president in which uh, no, all of his I don't uh, like, I do not like the Grinch in your eye right now. Were there all the you know his major staff were there? Uh, I mean, all the other and you can actually see it now. You, we didn't used to do this on video calls. Now you can see what's <laughs> happening worse. in the eyes, John. Seeing a pun is worse. Um, but yeah, uh, done uh, it. all all, uh, all his uh, the president and all his staff were there, and uh, some other folk too. Um, anyway, he, he set up a barbecue. We uh, barbecued the cheaper meat first. Uh, um, then stayed the posh stuff for later. Uh, he said to me, uh, Andy, it's time for the sirloin. I've done all Trump. Done, done all Trump. Oh, anyway, but he wanted to look good for the occasion, of oh. course, the president. And he had some Botox uh, treatment and plastic surgery on the lower part of his face beneath the mouth. Uh, he said the muscles were a bit taut still and it was hard to, to, to move. He said, uh, it's a bit stiff, my new chin. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, things got a bit fractious, actually. Uh, an argument broke out um, about the Trump campaign's failed court cases. Led to a very foul-mouthed employee of Santa Claus and the former governor of California uh, and famous action movie star agreeing uh, to a Hamilton Burr-style settlement of, uh, with pistols at dawn. It was uh, Rudolph Giuliani. <clears throat> I mean, I think... Uh, I don't think that's the correct response to that, John. Um, anyway, before it started, uh, Trump wrote a to-do list, uh, some agreement, uh, some disagreement about how to amplify the sound and the sound system and the degree to which the ceremony should be impressively grand. And then he wanted to deal with any other issues not covered by those. So he wrote on his list, Mike Pomp, A-O-B. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had a bit of a bit that's, of an argument about uh, that's the struggle. That's not okay. That's not okay, right. that one, Andy. I don't know <laughs> right, why sorry. that was worse. I couldn't explain to you why, yeah. but I felt it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, we had a bit of a debate because we were still waiting a bit of time to kill. So we talked about sport because Trump obviously likes his sport. Now. The struggles of the Philadelphia Eagles uh, replacing uh, Vents, their uh, co- uh, franchise quarterback. And he said, Andy, do you think they were right to bench Carson? Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, he had a collection of female deers in the White House uh, uh, grounds. He was so proud of them. He gave them a score out of every 10, depending on how perky they uh, looked. And he invited me to join him. Uh, he said, Andy, would you like to mar- would you like to mark my does? Mark Meadows, Mark Meadows. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, he's very interested in science, of course, uh, Trump. Uh, he told me one of the many research projects he's personally overseen uh, was uh, involved showing that fish and trees actually share some of the same genetic makeup. He explained the different types of skin of different breeds of fish is evolutionarily descended from the different barks of different trees. Those fish with genes from oak trees or redwoods have smoother skin, but the Eugene scalier. <coughs> And that was that was surely worth the journey, wasn't it, John? Andy, I mean, I, yeah. I think I've made Sorry, this clear. No. If you're right. not a snowplow, you can f the f off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Angela Merkel was there as well, um, and I spoke to her because uh, Trump uh, suddenly. Is this still going? For all the drinks, <laughs> yeah, still going. Uh, anyway, he, he suddenly remembered he hadn't s- settled up for the drinks, and he uh, panicked and uh, got his words mixed up. Bill Barr, he said. But Merkel was there, and uh, all the female world leaders who dealt with Trump were there too. And for a kind of parlour game, they had to write down adjectives that described the way that Trump treated them. I asked Merkel uh, what she thought would be most likely to have made that list, and she said, Andy, I, I would be surprised if uh, Chivalrous was, was one of them. Oh, Andy, <laughs> you're, you are beating a <laughs> cremated <can't>... horse. <laughs> Andy, I would be surprised if Chivalrous was one of those words. I'd put money on considerate not being one of them, but I bet CD was... <clears throat> Right, I'm, uh, I'm now done. Anyway, Trump was a bit sad when everyone left. He said goodbye, as always, in Italian, but unenthusiastically. It was uh, definitely a lame chow. Just Googling whether, Hold on. Pun, just Googling whether puns Hold are a war crime, Andy. It's not clear yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, you sound annoyed. I think I'm about to get Barrett, so bummer. You, but you showed the patience of Joe biding your time. Chris, sure that, you have the power. Yeah. Stop right. this. For the common good, uh, stop it. I stopped just... recording ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just conclude, and these words seem more appropriate now even than earlier in the show. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it's sensible in any way. <laughs> here, <laughs> here. <laughs> so I couldn't, I couldn't let you coming back on the bugle go without one of them, John. Well, just to could. remind you why you left. Just to remind you why you yeah. left in the first place. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're very conveniently taking agency out of the decision that you just made there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, it's the 21st century. That's what we do. Uh, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, to have you back on the show, lovely to see you. Um, it's great to have, be back in the past. Year, next year. Yeah, yeah, Thank sure, you. yeah, and you, and you, and the world, <laughs> and, and and you, Chris, you, Chris, but generally just as a as the planet, you know. 
Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's aim a little higher. Bye! Goodbye, Pugilus. We will play you out with some lies about our premium level voluntary subscribers. Uh, before the lies, one fact. You're about to buy that ticket for the Bugle Live Review of the Year show on the 30th of December. It also makes the ideal Christmas present if you can't make it out to the shops or just can't be asked to go and buy anything. If you want something to wrap up, just make a paper mache life-size sculpture of me, Alice Nish and NATO and a scale model of the world and that should get the message across. Go to thebuglepodcast.com where you can also join our voluntary subscription scheme and make recurring or one-off donations to support the show. Here are your lies. Kristen Wolf is worried about the number of satellites in orbit and reckons we need to start building them like pieces of a giant jigsaw that can slot together in space. Kristen explains, I reckon within one, maybe two thousand years, 50% of the sky will be satellite, so we have to start being smart about things or it's going to get very messy indeed. It's also obviously very important, adds Kristen, not to lose a piece of that jigsaw because that is extremely annoying. LD Nicholas May thinks it might help society in general if everybody, and Nicholas means everybody, had to do a sort of national service that involves being a private detective. I think we'd all benefit, says Nicholas, from honing our skills for examining evidence and information, and imagine the number of awesome detective novels that would probably eventually emerge. Steve Deckel, however, says that the last thing the world needs is more detective novels. If we're going to force people to do something compulsory like that, says Steve, I think it should be one or more of being a brain surgeon, a football referee and an air traffic controller. Explaining his reasoning, Steve says, I haven't really thought this through, but they're all jobs that I've had recurring nightmares about having to do with no training, so from a purely personal perspective, I think it would help if I had some experience. Someone known only as Scrubblesworth Fitzwit has always focused really, really hard when making a glass of orange squash or other fruit cordial. It's something I've done since childhood, says Scrubblesworth. Often, it used to say, concentrate on the bottle, so I did, and I still do. I assume that instruction was there because the cordial was so fruity it could corrode human skin, so you had to be really, really on it to avoid spillages. Scrubblesworth adds morosely, I wish all products had helpful advice like that on their labels. Erin Todd hopes that the unstoppable march of technology does not result in the photocopier becoming obsolete. Sure, says Erin, there might come a time when we no longer actually need the photocopier, but to my mind there is no sweeter form of entertainment and relaxation than standing next to a photocopier as it rhythmically churns out a thousand copies of a poster announcing that you have no missing pets to worry about, or 500 cancellation notices for a party you never really intended to hold. The noise, the sound, irreplaceable. And finally, John Lorenz managed to secure a job at an interview once by claiming that his personal hero was the Roman Emperor Fastidius Maximus, famously the Emperor with the most obsessional attention to detail. John was caught off guard by a who's your personal hero question, and he didn't want to give a hackneyed answer like Nelson Mandela, or my dad, or my mum, or your mum, or Enrique Iglesias. So he improvised impressively with the made-up Emperor Fastidius. Nonetheless, John was surprised to be appointed Professor of Ancient History at Harvard University. Here endeth this week's lies. Goodbye. 30th of December. Buy your tickets now.